Spinosaurus this, Spinosaurus that. Why aren't the others getting any love? Well, I intend to fix that by taking a look at the story of Spinosaurus as well as what it takes to join the club. So Spinosaurus fossils were discovered as far back as 1820, but it wasn't until the famous Ernst Stromer found and described Spinosaurus in 1915 that the group was established. Now, like I said in my Spinosaurus video, paleontologists at the time didn't get much of a chance to discover more about this animal, or indeed the group, since these limited remains were destroyed in World War II, and not much was really found until the 1980s, when another famous discovery, this time in England, led us to Baryonyx, as well as a lot more information about the group. Now, it is very hard to miss a Spinosaur. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to miss any kind of dinosaur, but Spinosaurs in particular were a very specialised and unique group of theropods. We see the first of these diagnostic features in the skull. Spinosaur skulls show a remarkable amount of convergent evolution with crocodilians, being very long and narrow, with much of the length being taken up by the maxilla and premaxilla, leaving the nostrils higher up the snout. These two bones were pretty weird in shape as well as length too. The top of the front of the snout formed a spoon-shaped expansion that in many Spinosaurs housed highly sensitive pressure sensors as well as highly enlarged teeth. Just behind this expanded snout end was also a notch in which the maxillary area raised and was filled with smaller teeth before going back to larger teeth, all of which were conical in shape with almost no serrations. When we look at the dentary or lower jawbone, we see the reverse of this in which the jaw fits perfectly together. When going further back along the skull, we see another common feature among Spinosaurs, and that is the crest that sat lengthways atop their nasal bones, which varied in shape depending on what genus we're talking about. The rest of the body also shared quite a few similarities with each other too. The forelimbs were actually surprisingly large and powerful for theropods, sporting three-fingered claws. These claws were particularly nasty too especially in certain genera like Baryonyx or Suchomimus, in which the first digit was especially long and curved. Those forelimbs may have been large for your average theropod, but the hind limbs tell a different story. Both the hind limb and hip regions of Spinosaurids were somewhat reduced to varying degrees, with the most extreme and infamous case being that of Spinosaurus itself. As to why, we'll get to that in a minute. And whilst we're on the main portion of the body, it's also worth mentioning the neural spine structures. Many have probably guessed from the name, but many Spinosaurs had elongated neural spines running along their backs, creating saddle-like structures. Again, these varied across genera, to the point that, despite the group's namesake, some members didn't have a notable sail at all. These neural spines also continued at elongated lengths along the tail's varying degrees. Some had, for lack of a better term, generic-looking theropod tails, but many of those with notable sails on their back show a similar elongation along the tail, creating a paddle-like structure. Do you see where I'm going with this? With regards to skin integument, we don't actually have any skin impressions from Spinosaurs, nor do feathers appear to be particularly ancestral to the overall group of Megalosauroids, which is the group that Spinosaurids are in, with no related group showing anything in the way of feathering either. In short, it's not impossible that these dinosaurs had feathers, but until it's proven otherwise, they were scaly to some degree. They also varied a lot in size, but they were still bloody huge. With the smallest being Irritator at between 6 to 8 meters or 20 to 26 feet long and around a ton, and the largest being Spinosaurus at 14 meters or 46 feet long and between 7 to 8 tons making it the longest known terrestrial predator in Earth's history. But how did they get to this point? Well, how Spinosaurs got their start is still being discussed. First, you need to know two main groups with Spinosaurids, the Baryonychines and the Spinosaurines. Baryonychines are the Spinosaurs which generally lack a back sail and are, for the most part, a little smaller, including members such as Baryonyx, Suchomimus, Ripperovenator, and Ceratosuchops. Then the Spinosaurines are the ones with some form of sail, including Ichthyovenator, Irritator, Oxalea, Sigilmasasaurus, and of course Spinosaurus. Now these two groups are important to compare when looking at paleogeography as well as chronology in order to figure out what their evolutionary story actually was. 
Despite this though, there are still some opposing theories floating around. We don't really have much information from before 130 million years ago, but given the Baryonychines appear more basal to other theropods in their postcranial skeleton, and the fact that they mostly appear in the early Cretaceous, the popular theory is that they actually gave rise to the more derived Spinosaurines, which appear across the middle of the period into the late Cretaceous, with Spinosaurus being the latest one. Now, it has been suggested that Spinosaurids were widespread across Pangaea, with the Baryonychines remaining basal in Laurasia and the Spinosaurines diverging in Gondwana. But this doesn't quite explain Suchomimus, which was an African Baryonychine. But to be fair, at the time a land bridge did exist between Morocco and Spain, meaning they could have gone across. Now, it was kind of thought that this was put to bed. But in 2016, teeth were found from the mid-Jurassic that were assigned to some sort of Spinosaurid in Niger. So, where did they originate? Europe or Africa? How far did they even reach out, considering that possible material has even been found in Asia and Australia? Well, I'm not sure on that one. But Baryonyx from England remains the oldest unquestioned Spinosaurid, so I will take a totally non-biased stance and say, you're welcome for Spinosaurs. <laughs> But divergent body plans can only mean one thing, and that is different lifestyles. It's long been known that Spinosaurs had a close affinity with water, showing through their snouts and teeth alone that they were mostly piscivorous. These teeth were conical with little to no serrations, which isn't great for tearing flesh, but is excellent for holding on to struggling, slippery prey, which is also helped by that notch I mentioned, which is known as a terminal rosette. But there have also been stomach contents found associated with baryonyx, which also show iguanodontia material as well as an irritated tooth embedded in a pterosaur vertebra, both of them likely scavenged, as well as an isotope analysis showing a mixture of fish and dinosaur feeding, so they weren't exclusively fish eaters. Now these long snouts were good for fishing, but not for killing large terrestrial animals. So the function of the relatively large forelimbs and claws have pivoted between either helping to gaff out fish from the water or to aid in killing any large prey they tried their luck on. It's also clear that the Spinosaurines especially went more down the aquatic route since their hind limbs were especially shorter with evidence that they had paddle-like tails and oxygen isotope levels in their bones being closer to crocodilians and turtles. Now, there has been quite a bit of controversy around Spinosaurus, especially when it comes to its actual swimming ability. Features on the animal's body are clearly aquatic adaptations, but 3D simulation models actually showed that Spinosaurus wasn't a very good swimmer, producing too much drag with its size and the sail getting in the way massively if swimming underwater, the details of which are in my Spinosaurus video. But I do have my own theory on this, though it is just a theory. I don't think Spinosaurus needed to be a particularly strong swimmer. Instead, it would pick spots to simply float in, taking a leisurely swim between each spot using the paddle tail without needing to accelerate particularly quickly, and then feed like a heron. Spinosaurus have been found to have been capable of extremely fast and powerful vertical movements with their heads, meaning they could snap things up very quickly. So it could just wait for something to come before using its quick bite to spear some massive fish. Now, this was likely the most aquatic lifestyle adopted by the Spinosaurids on a scale in which the opposite end was simply as riparian hunter, waiting along riverbanks or at most at ankle depth. And that is overall where we're currently at with Spinosaur knowledge. Now if there's anything you want me to go into more detail about, don't worry, I will be doing more videos on specific genre, so let me know down below. In the meantime, let's answer a viewer question. Now this is a new segment that I'm doing in which I answer a question from you guys at the end of every video. Now we have a windows in which I'm taking the questions through a YouTube community post rather than taking them in the comments down below because they'll just get lost otherwise and I just won't be able to keep track of them. Alternatively, if you want priority spots for your questions, check out the Patreon link in the description where you can sign up for that and other benefits in support of this channel. So this video's question comes from... Tomalicious G4255? I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that. Who has asked, what is the earliest animal that has ever existed? 
Ooh, okay, right. Okay, so the question of the earliest animal is a really difficult one because animals with mineralized hard parts didn't actually pop up until quite far into animal story. So most of the earlier stuff didn't actually preserve. Then there's the question of what is actually classed as an animal, uh, which is anything that has a digestive system. So originally paleontologists estimated sea sponges to be the oldest animal through phylogenetic studies that cropped up some 800 million years ago. But a few years back, there was another study that was redone in a similar fashion, along with some really complicated genetic studies. And they actually found that the earliest animal was a comb jelly. Despite the name, they're not actually jellyfish. They're basically these tiny invertebrates with jelly-like bodies that are only about four cells thick. And they also use tentacles to swim. But they can actually get quite big today at up to five feet. Now this is really confusing because comb jellies are surprisingly complex. They've got things like muscles, connective tissues, organs, including sensory organs, and those kind of things don't just pop up one day. But just to be clear, this is the earliest estimated animal, not the earliest physical fossil that we have, nor is it actually the first animal because obviously there was a build up to that. In terms of the earliest animal to actually have ever existed, again, it's difficult to say because an animal is technically something with a digestive system. And again, that, that kind of thing just doesn't pop up one day. So there was obviously a build up to that in multicellular or even colonial organisms. So where do you draw the line at what's an animal and what's a colonial organism? But the oldest physical animal fossil ever found was a type of sea sponge from about 890 million years ago found in Canada. That is a great question though. I really hope they're all as good as that. Anyway, thank you so much for watching because it really does mean a lot to me. Please consider leaving a like and a subscribe if you haven't already and I will catch you guys next time.